you're starting out, immerse yourself in every aspect of the e-com ecosystem as possible. Have that holistic view, get exposure to all of the different moving parts because within that will be your opportunity of where you can understand the wider e-com infrastructure and identify your strengths and where you want to specialise in because your, I'm sure your interests will be piqued once you um, kind of turn over the stone and, and look at something and do a bit more like fact finding in a particular area. Um, having that level or that foundation of understanding, if you have that holistic view to begin with, that will be your future friend um, when you're looking to specialise. So yeah, definitely, I wouldn't say necessarily take your time because as we know, e-com moves so quickly and apps are like, you know, stay so frequent in, in being released. Welcome to the e-commerce toolbox, Expert Perspectives, a podcast by Noibu, where we explore the elite strategies and cutting edge insights with our expert guests. Get ready to propel your e-commerce business to the next level. Welcome to another episode of the e-commerce toolbox, Experts Perspectives. Joining us today, we have a digital and e-com manager and a digital expert in Ash Pallet. Welcome, uh, welcome Ash. Hi, Kaylin. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Um, as you can probably hear, uh, my my sincere condolences for uh, England losing the uh, the Euro Cup finals uh, to all the football fans listening. We chatted about it bef- a bit before, but Ash is uh, she's she's over it by now, and and, and we're onwards and upwards. Um, so I wanted to start off by learning a bit more about your background and how you ended up um, heading up ecom and, and digital at uh, at Sarah Raven. Sure, thanks, Kayleen. Um First of all, pleasure to be invited on to the Noibu podcast. Hey, thank you very much for having me. So. I'm just going to uh, roll it back to um, when I was back at college was actually when I had my first um, kind of, I guess, exposure to websites. Um, one of the assignments that I was handed was um, building my own. So um learned kind of from the ground up. And that was really, I guess, where I caught the bug. Um, then a fast forward into kind of my first full time role. I didn't go to university because I thought I'd have a bit of a break, see what was out there. Landed my first full-time role working for a handicraft business and it was just the founder and I. So again, really good kind of foundations. I was everything from customer services, finance, uh, quality control, marketing, PR, etc. Literally from the dining room in her house. So looking back, being 18, as I said, great foundation. Um, and then from there, I moved on to a uh, a brand manager for a chain of aesthetic clinics. So look to establish their e-com store from the ground up. Um, that was to essentially supplement their in-clinic treatments. So skincare at home that you could follow on after you've been to the clinic. Um, and that was really my first taste of a wider e-com ecosystem. So from everything from ESPs, ERPs, um, and then Kind of more recently from there, I moved into Oak Furniture Land, launching the American website. And then for the last eight years, um, I've been at Sarah Raven as their e-com manager. So yeah, quite a varied, I guess, cycle of roles. But um, yeah, really good exposure and great learning opportunities as well along the way. Yeah, it's so interesting. I always, uh, it seems like everyone I interview always starts off with like, well, I didn't study for e-com and I kind of ended up in it um, when, I, when I took a job and it kind of just compounds over time. So it's really, really cool to hear that. And obviously you've held different roles at Sarah Raven over the last eight years. Maybe talk to us about your current role. I mentioned your title earlier up, kind of being a senior digital e-com manager. Maybe talk to us a bit about like what that actually means. Yeah, sure. So at Sarah Raven, we're a pretty lean pretty lean team supporting a 20 million plus business. So being a smaller team, my role varies considerably, but main points of focus are conversion rate optimization to Crow, mitigating friction points in our customers' journeys, um, supporting really the innovation and the growth of the business. So what what does the roadmap look like? Where are we taking it to the next level? And for us as well, it's I've kind of been the, should I say the torch bearer when it comes to thinking digital first in what has traditionally been a print first direct to consumer business so I'd say my role is um it play covers kind of lots of silos um and definitely kind of pushing forward pushing that innovation and that evolution forward for the brand oh that's uh that's great um a couple of years ago you were part of a big replatforming project at Sarah Raven where you guys ended up on big commerce Maybe talk to me a bit about um, why you guys made that choice and uh, and how that's been going since. Sure. So, yeah, absolutely right. A few years now that we've been partnered with Beacom, at the time that we decided to make that move, our incumbent agency were 
they'd built their own proprietary system that we were on and had been on for about seven years. Um, so we were, they had come, approached us looking to change their services and pivot completely towards a Shopify Plus agency. Uh, we had been talking around kind of the sidelines, but never really nailed the conversation around, you know, where do we go next? Is it, is it something we need to consider? It's a, it's a massive, massive kind of wider conversation piece, right? Internally, by getting all the buy-in from stakeholders, the board, the level of investment. So um, that conversation with that SI at the time really acted as that catalyst to push us into, okay, now we need to knuckle down. Let's have a look at the market, what's moving, what isn't, contact our, um, lots, of di- lots of our different social networks. Really kind of started on a bit of a fact-finding mission. Um, and we'd been on that platform for about seven years, so it really was quite... Um, a significant kind of, should I say, project of magnitude that took a lot of consideration, a lot of due diligence. And yeah, proud to say that we've been on Bitcoin now, come just past our, our third anniversary. Love it. Sounds uh, sounds really cool. Maybe talk to us a bit about that cumbersome process of scoping a project as big as a replatforming and effectively why you guys made that decision. And, and yeah, maybe even some of the challenges that, that you guys had along that, along that road. Yeah, sure. So Telling the listeners a little bit about Sarah Raven, we aren't a standard out-of-the-box e-com retailer. We are a premium gardening brand selling plants, bulbs, seeds, kit. We have, shall I say, quite a complicated product setup when it comes to perishable goods. So fulfilling orders, when we're relying on nurturing the product, managing the expectation of our customer from fulfillment, um, you know, surfacing delivery times. If there's crop failure, what does that look like? So there was lots of different moving parts to this. Um, and so the process overall, end to end, um, was about 13 months in total. But I'm just going to break it down. Um, I think these are kind of what I'd say are my four key stages. Um, why the replatform, the process we kind of went through, and potentially some of the challenges that we, that we saw as we went through. So I'll cover each one in turn, but due diligence, definitely the first one. RFP, tendering process, really important reference calls and then going on to discovery so the initial due diligence super important I needed to do my own fact finding if I was going to be the project lead on this internally so initially we needed to get the buy-in from the business talk to different departments what were their pain points um, what did they feel was potentially a friction point not just from an admin perspective but for our customers Um, really I guess, understanding the functionality that we needed and using the opportunity to, um, I guess, have a step change in in our um, opportunity as a business, but also as to what we were serving our customers. So we needed that core functionality to support us on that growth trajectory as a business in, in terms of where we wanted to be going. So um, re- really important in terms of um, just doing that fact finding, who's out there, what's moving, what's recommended. Um, because then when you go into other conversations, it whether it be SIs or whether it be um, other platforms alike, you can kind of hit the ground running. You kind of you get to know the buzzwords, you get to know the jargon a bit more and you know what, what type of questions to ask. Um, moving on to RFP and tendering process probably feels like I would say the most painful part of the process outside of launching. Um, what I would say to you or a tip I'd give you is the devil is in the detail document how you want things to work make sure you have data flows of your entire ecosystem that will be an act as your future friend much further kind of down the process um, as Sarah Raven to help identify those requirements that was needed uh, we followed I'd say quite we, we we made ourselves quite strict in following the Moscow rules what were our must-haves what were our could-haves what were our should-haves that really helped to prioritize um, our laser focus throughout the whole the whole of that transition piece. Um, and then just moving on quickly. So one of our reference reference calls was one of our kind of next big, I think, thing areas to consider. And it was really insightful exercise and probably one that I don't think gets a lot of credit through or mentions through through you know different podcasts and different kind of conferences when you hear about platform migrations. I do think reference calls are really that considered until kind of really after the event. So I would use the opportunity to um, speak to clients of the SIs that you're looking to work with, customers of the platforms that you're looking to work with, and ask questions like, what did you compromise on? Where your deadlines adhered to? Where your budgets met? 
if something went wrong, could you escalate it? Um, you know, did, did, did the platform and the SI come together and help solutionize with you if there was a problem? I'm invested in this as a um, as a client and I want to make sure that you get the most bang for your buck. And I'm committed. So therefore, I'm hoping the SI and the platform would be as committed. So asking those kind of pain, painful questions to other references, I think, is really cool for you to get a true understanding of who it is you're working with or how potential of working with and um, basically how, how you then move that forward. And then um, very briefly, discovery. Discovery was really core cool for us. Again, the detail continues through to discovery. It's an important part of the whole puzzle piece when it comes to a migration. The RFP, if you've done it right and it's detailed at the beginning and you've captured your requirements, that will really help set the scene for your discovery. Um, and one thing I'd recommend or something we certainly instilled at Sarah Raven was having a break clause at the end of discovery. Because if you find that the SI you're working with or you've appointed and the platform you've appointed for whatever reason don't work, either they both don't work or one of them just isn't the right fit, this gives you the opportunity to go, OK, guys, look, have that grown up conversation. You don't want to then find actually the fit isn't right when you're three quarters of the way through the project. Do it at that point and then you can reassess, take stock and decide from there where you want to go. So quite a lot of information, quite a few tips and quite a short um, a space of time. But hopefully the listeners will, will take something out of that and will help for anyone who's looking at migrating. No, I think it makes sense. And, and one thing that we know to be true is regardless of what platform or which SI that you choose, these things are always hard. They're hairy. There's always details that are overlooked and in, in, at some process. And then comes the big launch day. Do you, could you talk, maybe talk us through like the big launch day and, and, and how you guys looked at stabilization and, and how that's kind of evolved into your, your view of the website now and how you guys are investing and in making it better over time and, and just looking at stability and things like that? Yeah, sure. So first question around kind of launch day. Um, I think it's actually a successful launch if it's like a non-dramatic moment, like it almost like it didn't happen. They're, they're the kind of, the, they're the ones you want to go after because, um, you know, that everything kind of running on time, you know, um, that things that have, have run smoothly, effectively. Whereas if you have this huge to da moment or ultimately something's fallen over and you have to kind of gather the troops, you know, something's not gone down that well. So the kind of less of a anticlimax it is on go, on go, on, on the go live day, the better. Um, but kind of like to your latter question, kind of moving forward, pressing the fast forward button, what were our challenges? How did we overcome them? Um, I think, should I say, there was probably two to three main challenges that that we kind of stumbled across as we went through that whole process. Um, again, take them all each one in turn. Design. Um, we went through a, a total redesign for Sarah Raven as part of the migration piece, although it was um, a total kind of lift and shift onto a new platform it was a total redesign at the same time so um for us as a brand we pride ourselves so much on look feel theater and drama you're really buying into the incredible curated collections that Sarah Raven sells and offering you the help and hand as to how you can achieve that and achieve that look in your own garden so theater and drama and look and feel really important to us um, we found that time was very quickly eaten away um, when it came even just version one of the designs, even the wireframe stage. And I think looking back, I would certainly allocate more time to design. If as a brand you are, you know, your look and feel is everything to you, I would definitely look to allocate. If you're thinking of allocating whatever time you're thinking of allocating, double it, triple it, because you know that it would pay off dividends based down the line. Although... Yes, we did probably compromise on the designs to some degree. The silver lining of that is that it, film, it formed an opportunity for us to review that later down the line, which I'll probably touch upon a little bit later as, as we chat through. But yeah, design definitely won. Um, testing as well. Again, enormity of the size of the project, the magnitude of it. I think we probably went into it not really understanding the amount of resource needed for testing. So we... Um, uh, we appointed a third a third party agency to help us more so from the data flow side of things, so we could really nail the back end side of things, and then we could focus, as I said, more so on the front end, the look and feel. 
So concurrently, we had lots of kind of different silos of the project working together. Um, but having the RFP, the data flow, it all kind of kept the circles back around. Um, having that information meant we could hand that over to the third party agency to help that with that data flow piece. Um, and then finally, knowledge. I think, again, it's really underestimated within your team when you're looking to migrate, once you have launched and once you have migrated, the muscle memory of what you've just lost at the platform that you were on before. That's out the window. That's, that's, uh, that's in the past now. You have to leverage um, all of that knowledge, apply it to a new system. And I think as well, manage expectations internally. Something that might take, we used to take, I don't know, 20 minutes to do, might take an hour to do on the new system. Just have patience. And I think then you've got to kind of get everyone on board with you as you go, as you learn. Um, but definitely remember that you will be losing that knowledge when you migrate because it kind of literally within a split second of you launching that that knowledge is gone and you have to look forward and move forward on that new platform. Um, so yeah, definitely some some challenges, but yeah, three years on, we've definitely overcome them and we're probably um, witnessing some different challenges along the way, uh, especially navigating a post-COVID world. Um, but yeah, all, all good learning though as, as, as we went through. No, I'm, I'm glad to hear. And obviously now that it's been stable, it's been a couple of years now, maybe let's flip this combo into some of your kind of more current CRO activities. Maybe talk to us a bit about the role of personalization. How does that drive conversion for a brand like Sarah Raven? Um, yeah, maybe talk to us a bit about your high level kind of strategies and your thoughts around that. Yeah, sure. So personalization, it's probably been, a, well, it is definitely a buzzword of the moment. The last maybe 12, 18 months or so, it's certainly great in popularity. Um, what I would say is if we take it right back to the start, looking at, at Google, um, or at least Google, um, but taking Google's lead on it, if you're relevant and you're in the right place at the right time, you're going to solve a lot of customers' queries, looking at the levels of intent, looking at, um, you know, the just being at the right time at the right place. The more targeted and the more personalized you can be, the better. And that can come in a myriad of different forms. Um, so just recently, we've launched um, a personalized product bundling app on our PDPs. And by that, I mean um, essentially showcasing customers through really what I think is a simple UI, but whatever customers bought, what went well with, almost like a cross-sell opportunity. Um, but the UI is so simple that you're not disrupting that customer's journey. Customers can really simply add to basket within that same PDP. They're not taking off elsewhere. So to be able to add to cart in a really simple, effective, kind of one-click manner um, has really kind of paid dividends to us. So if we just want to call out, I know some, I'm sure some listeners will like a good stat. Um, so in Q1, uh, when we launched that put that personalization of product bundling, um, the results have driven £250,000 worth of incremental sales. So um, if that helps in terms of, you know, why personalization? Um, I think if you do it right, if you're relevant and in the right time at the right place, I think it will absolutely evolve your brand and drive those sales that you're after. Yeah, that makes sense. And how do you think this is going to interchange with what we're seeing in like AI? Do you expect that to be kind of built into some of the tools that you guys are using? Yeah, I'm curious, like, how do you think AI could really kind of help increase the productivity coming from personalization? Yeah, sure. So I think AI, um, again, definitely certainly has its place. I think it does, it can come with its own caveats, like AI is not, you know, don't, don't 100% trust it. Um, but when you're looking at, like I mentioned before, probably quite a lean team, AI driven content is, um, is where it's at. And if you can overlay that AI with a level of sophistication, such as customer segmentation, customer insights, customer behavior, that's when I think it gets really exciting. Again, going back to the relevancy and being in the right place at the right time, showing the right content, it's a really powerful tool. And um, for us at Sarah Raven, that means the resource that would typically be spent on things, let's take an example, so cat merchandising we used to be able to um essentially manually pin products at the top of at the top of pages um whereas now uh, we've part recently onboarded with a new partner to make that ai driven to take on board the, the the customer behavior take on board the sales data what's driving these sales optimize it with with um co best convert converting products at the top or um, look at the um, slow moving lines, for example, kind of driving that narrative for the customers. 
um, we've certainly seen that 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 um, that resource element really come into play, and where our employees have been able to repivot their their time and reallocate their time is looking at the data, not looking at just the why, but looking at the what. So then we can really take that and then evolve the AI even more. Look at what it's telling us. How are customer behaving? How are they behaving? How are they interacting? How can we use that to our advantage to then, um, you know, is it that actually we need to we need to invest in, in a more of a particular product or we need to buy in more of a, a specific range? Or is it actually the learning is people just don't buy into that particular product. Let's demote it. Let's push something else in. So it really gives us all the opportunity to harness time better um, when a lot of us, you know, we're time poor, we're busy. We've all got things to be cracking on with. So I think AI definitely has its place. Um, and if you can, as I said, overlay with more elements of sophistication, I think the more return you're going to see on these investments that you um, that you aim for as a business. Love it. Cool. Ash, as we look to wrap up, any parting uh, words for anyone who's kind of maybe newer in their career? They're just starting out in e-com for the first time. Curious, any kind of uh, parting words of wisdom from your side? Uh, in a very short, sweet answer, I'd say go for it. Um, in terms of kind of top tips and given my experience, I would say if you're starting out, immerse yourself in every aspect of the e-com ecosystem as possible. Have that holistic view, get exposure to all of the different moving parts, because within that will be your opportunity of where you can understand the wider e-com infrastructure and identify your strengths and where you want to specialize in, because your I'm sure your interests will be peaked once you... Um, kind of turn over the stone and, and look at something and do a bit more like fact finding in a particular area um having that level or that foundation of understanding if you have that holistic view to begin with that will be your future friend um when you're looking to specialize so yeah definitely i wouldn't say necessarily take your time because as we know e-com moves so quickly and apps are like you know stay frequent in in being released, but um, the core fundamentals, I'd say, yeah, immerse yourself in it, get to grips with it, and then you can start to kind of really have laser focus on on the area in, in particular that, that you want to focus on. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's probably the, the advice I'd give. Cool. Love it. Thanks again, Ash. This has been a really, really amazing uh, episode. So thanks again for your time. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks, Kayla. I enjoyed it. The e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives is brought to you by Noibu. To find out more about Noibu and how we can help you debug your e-commerce site and rocket your revenue, visit www.noibu.com. That's N-O-I-B-U.com. And then make sure to search for the e-commerce toolbox expert perspectives on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found and click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Noibu, thanks for listening.